And we are live! You already know who it is. My name is Mike Kyle, aka the Fantasy Vulture. I have over a decade worth of fantasy football experience, and I've continuously competed for fantasy championships over the course of the past six seasons. Let's make it seven in 2020. But enough of me. I'm here for you. On today's episode of the FB Show, we are going to continue our Week 3 game previews, breaking down every single Week 3 matchup all through the lens of fantasy football. Up next, the Washington football team versus the Cleveland Browns. If you are excited for this game preview, be sure to hit that like button down below, like an open receiver downfield, and also smash that subscribe button like a power running back up the middle so that you never miss a video from me. Not saying that I'm counting, but I am 23 subscribers away from 100, and I would love to hit that by the end of week three. Also, you can follow me on all social media platforms at FFVulture, Instagram, and Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, not really TikTok anymore. RIP. Where's, where's the water again? Got, got to pour one out for TikTok. For a second, I thought the cap wasn't on that, and I was going to dump water all over my desk. That could have been horrific. Um, What is not horrific, though, is going to be the Washington versus Cleveland football game taking place this weekend. There's actually a lot of fantasy intrigue surrounding this matchup. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to save it. Uh, for a night where I know I wasn't going to cram and I could actually kind of just talk and uh, and get some thoughts out because I have quite a few in this matchup. So let's get started, shall we? Both teams are one and one. Uh, obviously, Washington is still kind of in this, not even like, in like they're not really in the basement of the NFL, but they kind of are. They're like, they're walking up the steps to get out of the basement, right? And the Browns are just trying to rebound from the uh, from the atrocity that was last season. Um, Washington, so far, has had a very impressive defense. Specifically, their defensive line is just utterly incredible. Chase Young, their num the number two overall draft pick, looks absolutely legit. Um, but, that being said, the Browns have the number two rushing offense in the NFL. And they really should be number one, but Aaron Jones just went crazy last week uh, against Detroit. So that really skewed Green Bay's numbers just a little bit. Uh, so the Browns, obviously, we know, the, we know the, what their rushing attack can do with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. And I think it's going to be one of those things where what what moves first? Is it going to be the defensive line or is it going to be the Browns running backs? There are no injuries to note in this game, and that is always a good thing uh, this early on in the season. We know the list of players that are injured right now. Have been It's been long, it's been extensive, and it's been challenging for a lot of fantasy owners. In fact, I was actually reading through, I was reading through Twitter the other day, and I forget who it was, so I can't quote them directly, but somebody said that, the number one and number two running backs, uh, so it's uh, Barkley and CMC, the number one and number two wide receivers, Michael Thomas and Devontae Adams, and the number one tight end, uh, George Kittle, they're all battling injuries right now. And that, like, that is absolutely unheard of, uh, at, at least at this point in the season, right? And just it's very, very weird to just have the top guys at every fantasy football position shall we say right because we, because IDP isn't standard yet uh, it's very just it's very weird to have the top fantasy players just out all at once it really is bizarre um so having no injuries to note in this game is actually a blessing right so let's move over to some start set uh for the Browns you're starting Nick Chubb just because stay in stay in the flames he's played pretty well all year obviously that game last week against Cincinnati was incredible same thing with Kareem Hunt I think this is just one of those things where you can start both and this was something that I wasn't entirely sure of coming into the season right what would Kareem Hunt's role in this team going to be uh, with Kevin Stefanski moving over uh, as head coach now and bringing over that Minnesota style offense would Kareem Hunt have a role the answer is yes obviously that two-year extension definitely solidifies his value for this football team and then also the auto, and then I, I'm, auto starts may be the wrong word here, but I have confidence starting Odell Beckham. Um, Odell actually had a very interesting comment earlier this week, and he was basically saying that he doesn't expect to put up those high profile numbers that he that he that he once did. Um, and I felt like him coming out and saying that was a uh, woo. -hoo -hoo. That's that's certainly something. I want to see if I can pull up the direct quote. Um, Odell. Beckham um, numbers quote. I have no idea if this is even gonna pop up. Add in it. Odell Beckham. Odell Beckham. I'm just gonna put Odell Beckham quote. Let's see what comes up here. Anything? 
anything. I can't find it. But basically, yeah, basically Odell said that um, just because the way that this that the way that this offense is structured, ba being based so heavily around the run game, um, it's going to limit what he can do on the field. And just him coming out and saying that, I felt so bad for anybody who owns Odell and, and is in the position to try and trade him because when the wide receiver himself is saying like, "Hey, I'm not going to put up the numbers that everyone is expecting me to," that's one way to absolutely tank your trade value in fantasy. Regardless, though, just coming off of the great game that he had last week, I'm willing to roll the dice again. Uh, if you guys remember uh, on that on that Thursday night game, I was saying during the preview like. If he couldn't get it done against the Bengals, then I don't know what you could do with them. Luckily, he did come through, and so you kind of have to ride. Uh, you have to ride what's hot, what's trending, and right now he has another decent matchup against the Washington football team. So I'm comfortable starting Odell this week. The big question I have for the Browns is, what are you doing with Jarvis Landry? Because I would normally say, you start Jarvis Landry almost every single week. He's a great flex option. I love him in that role because, you know, he's guaranteed, you know, six targets. Or I'm sorry, six receptions, probably eight targets or so. He's going to haul in 75 receiving yards. And there is always touchdown potential with him. But when you look at what he's done through the first two weeks, right? Uh, week one, six targets, five receptions for 61 yards. And then week two, three targets, three receptions for 46 so the Jarvis numbers that we are very accustomed to seeing, he just hasn't hit yet. And is he going to be the uh, the odd? I, is I man left out isn't right, isn't the right word, but is he going to be one of the one of the lesser focused options because of the way that this offense is structured with that running game heavy offense or that run, that run heavy uh, style rather? And then Odell being, you know, the number one option. And now is Jarvis going to actually take that step back? Because one of the things that I was saying all offseason, I, and I, I, I was even saying it last year, was Jarvis Landry is the number one wide receiver on this team. And I don't think people realize that. But now that they are trying to get Beckham the ball, and if you guys remember week one, Beckham had 10 targets versus the Ravens. He obviously played great uh, last week versus the Bengals. Now I feel like the pecking order is just suddenly sliding and Jarvis is now kind of moving over to number four on this team set uh, on this team's list of offensive weapons so I'm gonna sit Jarvis I think during this matchup it's not something I'm I'm excited I'm not like happy to sit Jarvis right because I do think he's a really good football player and he's always been great for fantasy but if the way that this offense continues to trend is just leaving him kind of behind it's unfortunately the move that you have to make Austin Hooper at the tight end position is 100% droppable. Uh, he's splitting snaps with multiple other tight ends, so we don't like that naturally for uh, for tight end production. And then also he just hasn't done it. The, the volume's been low, the yardage has been low, and the touchdowns just haven't been there as well. Granted, it, it has only been two weeks, but just looking again at the way that this offense is structured, Austin Hooper is what? The fifth option? And that's not something that you're really excited about for the tight end position. Over to Washington now. Um, Terry McLaurin, auto start, like you, he is, he played incredible last week against the Cardinals. He's a guy that you drafted in that fifth or sixth round to be your number two or your number three wide receiver. If you have major flex, it's a great flex play. If you have major number two, totally fine with it. The question for me, for Washington, is it actually Antonio Gibson season? Week one, we saw Peyton Barber get 17 snaps. I think, uh, let me pull up Antonio Gibson's snap count real quick. All right, Antonio Gibson, there we go. Yes, so Peyton Barber had 17 carries week one. He got the majority of the, of the, of the, majority of the backfield work from Washington. Antonio Gibson played 26% played of the snaps that game. He actually had nine carries as well. But what we saw last week was the complete opposite of what we saw week one. And this was something that I'm really, really mad that I wasn't able to get a game recap from last week. Because with this game and with a few others as well, I saw this in Tampa Bay too. Everything that we thought we knew about week one, whether it was Ronald Jones or Peyton Barber, uh, just being the guy for their respective teams, everything flipped up for week two. Like week two was Antonio Gibson and Leonard Fournette. So everything that I thought I knew, I now don't, and I'm really fucking confused. I really am. This I, I have Antonio Gibson in every league that I'm in. I 
I, I just, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what to do with him this week. He played 64% of the snaps week two versus Arizona. He had 13 carries for 55 yards and a touchdown. And what are, is he the guy now moving forward? The receiving work still isn't there, you know, on what we want it to be. But if he is going to be the guy, can you play him? Like the answer is yes. Like if you knew Antonio Gibson was the guy, you are probably starting him. But through two weeks, we have two entirely different game scripts. And I I just, I can't start him. I can't, I can't start Antonio Gibson. Again, this is one thing that I've been saying with a lot of the rookies. I'm waiting to see it. If I don't see it, I don't feel comfortable playing them in all honesty. So this week, I'm going to say Antonio Gibson again. Because what I said, I think, regarding Gibson specifically, actually, um, in week one, I wasn't comfortable starting Gibson week one because I'm comfortable with missing out on the breakout game, knowing for a fact that I'm going to get that for the rest of the season, if that makes sense. I'll tank that one game where Gibson goes off on my bench, but then I know for a fact I'm comfortable starting him every single week uh, for the rest of the season. For me, one more thing I want to bring up with Washington, and that's tight end Logan Thomas. For me, he's a must-start this week against the Browns. The Browns have given up the second most points to tight ends behind the Eagles, and the Eagles obviously just, just gave up three touchdowns to Tyler Higby, so that too is going to skew the numbers just a little bit. But the Browns versus tight ends, 18 receptions, 148 yards, and three touchdowns. Uh, Mark Andrews killed them in week one, and who did they just play? And then uh, CJ Ozama and Drew Sample both crushed them in week two as well. So Logan Thomas is a guy who's been uh, bubbling. He was a name that uh, was being mentioned in deeper leagues throughout the course of the offseason. In week one, he had eight targets for four or four receptions and 37 yards and a touchdown. And then in week two, he played 90, he played 91% of the snaps, saw nine targets, four receptions for 26 yards. So the production wasn't necessarily there, but for tight ends, we like to follow the targets. And with Dwayne Haskins, look, they may be ugly. They may be ugly, but the targets are going to come for Logan Thomas. So if you lost George Kittle, I think uh, Logan Thomas is a great spot start for you this week. And maybe if you even want to hold him through re for the rest of the season, there could be a breakout coming for him. So thank you so much for watching this game preview. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like and subscribe down below. I'm doing this for every single week through your game. Link to the playlist will be linked right up here. Also up here, you can follow me on all social media platforms at FF Vulture. I think that's it. Is there anything else? We covered everything. All right. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to get up out of here. Remember, people come and go, but fantasy championships are forever, and I will see you in the next video.